the Fairy Whispering podcast explores guests' encounters with the other world of fairy and ways of connecting with this realm. From listening to messages in owl's hoots, finding a four-leaf clover, chasing rainbows or inviting a gnome to dinner. I'm Claire Sylvan Wand, a fairy whisperer, researcher and your guide on this journey. Take my hand and step into the twilight woodland where they are waiting to meet you. to the Fairy Whispering podcast and I'm really excited to have Ramona Miles with me today who is the Chakra Alchemist. Ramona works with ancient Egyptian Kemetic teachings with her chakra work. She's from Chicago, Illinois. We're going to talk about fairies and Egypt and lots of other exciting stuff. She's a very magical person. Before the episode, a reminder that you can support the podcast on patreon.com slash fairy whisperer, spelt F-A-E-R-Y. £3 a month gives you access to early releases, bonus episodes and lots of other goodies, such as EVPs, photos and artwork for the shows. Episode 2 and 3 of my mini-series, A Place Like No are also available or you can give a one-off donation on my Fairy Whisperer Buy Me A Coffee page. I offer Fairy Guide portrait readings which you can find on Etsy. Follow me on Instagram at Fairy Whispering Podcast. I also have a YouTube channel with video versions of episodes and other videos about how to connect with fairies and some peeks into pixie places on Dartmoor. You can get in touch on my contact form on my website or by emailing me claire at fairywhisperer.co.uk. All of this info is in the description for the episode. Enjoy this episode and join me at the end for some final thoughts. Welcome, Ramona. Great to meet you. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you very much, Claire. We had a little chat, didn't we, a few weeks ago now, where you were sharing one of your fairy experiences. So perhaps we can start with that and then talk more about your Egyptian work, which is very magical as well. You were talking about a fairy garden that you were creating. Oh, yes. Um, There's a a wonderful story behind the garden, why it was created. (laughs) Um, I was visiting my daughter in in Mm. Mississippi, and she found out that um, the nettle leaf and flower uh, could be used as a tincture, right? So we got our recipes together. We went and got some oil and we went out in her yard and picked some. And at the same time, this was happening. The landlord had chopped down some trees in the back. And we both realized that there was a huge energy shift when that happened. I felt really heartbroken when I, when I arrived and Mm. the trees were, were in chops and pieces in the yard with some disarray. Right. So it didn't help that we just went out and picked the flowers out the front yard. And we made the the um the oils. We jarred everything. We put them back in a in a dark place for them to um uh to sit. When we went back to go get them, they were gone. So she did some research for permission. Mm-hmm. We didn't ask for permission. Um we did find, I think maybe the previous uh tenants had little signs like little fairy signs it was really cute what we found is that we didn't ask the fairies for permission and Mm. so we couldn't find the oil oh now yeah yes Mm -hmm. and it was very interesting so of of course you go you spend some time like looking around because the someone's were the fairies (laughs) um Mm. so i made a garden and uh-huh. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll share photos. I've, I've sent you some yeah, photos. I'd love you to can see share that. the photos. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh. But we found a, a beautiful big bowl and uh, I, I researched, I went on Pinterest and looked around for some ideas mm-hmm. and really couldn't find exactly what I wanted. Mm-hmm. But as a child, in my active imagination, I always used to think about little people and having mm-hmm. a beautiful little garden for little people. So uh, one day my daughter, we were going to just pick up household goods, tissue, paper towels, things like that. And because she had just had her baby. (laughs) So she was excited to be out, you know. And in the store was little miniature fairy garden stuff. Oh, oh. So we just, I just went completely nuts. So I found a nice little um, set tea, had a chair, a table, two chairs, a little table. I said, this would be perfect for sitting and having tea in the garden. Uh, a swing said, you know, you'll see everything on yeah. the uh, in the photos. Oh. So when I got back home, I sat there and I was like, how should I design this? Right. Mm. And it just all started to come, you know, uh, come together. Mm-hmm. But instead of planting fake flowers or putting fake flowers in there, I planted real stuff, mint mm. and um, something else, something else, another little flower that's small that can bloom and then some of the nettle. Mm-hmm. And so um, I finished everything. I chopped up some eggshells, not very fine, but large enough to be little small stepping stones. And I created a path going through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put that out in the yard and I wished them well. And, And that was my apology for not asking for permission. And, you know, it's like, here's a beautiful garden for you. Yeah. Fast forward. Um, a year, my daughter mm-hmm. had moved, still could not find the oil. She did take mm-hmm. and relocate the the fairy, the garden, and she put it out on the, uh, in her yard and covered most of the side of it. So it's just, mm-hmm. you know, like it's embedded in the ground. And every year, you know, the, um, the mint would grow, everything would just blossom, you know, in there. Yeah. Here it is, maybe three, three years, three and a half years later. Mm-hmm. I'm on a uh, I'm on site working mm-hmm. uh, on the website pro, pro project with a client, and yeah. they have a horse camp. This is a place where you know horse lovers who own horses, or if you just oh, like nice. riding, mm-hmm. they can come and ride and and set up their trailers and things like that. So I came here, and my daughter drove from Mississippi to meet me here. Right now, I'm in Southern Illinois. She she comes, she brings the children, they go back home. She said they opened the door or they were they were going outside or coming inside. And she said, mm-hmm. Ma, I saw a fairy. I was like, what? Wow. What are you kidding? You know, yeah. first thing I thought about, you know, because mm-hmm. really we have been asking to, sh- you know, like show us that we are okay. We did something wrong. Let us know. We weren't mm-hmm. the ones cutting the tree down, mm-hmm. but we may as well have been because we did something else to violate that space without even asking for permission. Mm-hmm. So um a lot of things over the over that time frame for the you know within been shown to me, not only just from the fairy world, but other worlds of of beings that we are interacting with and we don't know mm-hmm. that even with last night's meditation in my group, when I pulled a card, the card was basically about respect. Oh. And I was like, oh. Because if you allow not just love to lead you, but what follows that would be the respect. That's the evidence mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. how you love yourself and something else. Yeah. It's respect, right? If you respect yeah. others, you think, then that's one of the things that you will attract back to you is more of why someone be, would be respectful of you. Yes. Such a wonderful lesson. Mm-hmm. Beautiful that's lesson. Amazing. I've, I've, I, I just get excited and chills yeah. just remembering um, that experience, and, you know? <laughs> and this is a, yeah, it's really interesting because for that jar to appear a year later in a totally different place, and I, I've, I've spoken to other people that this has happened to where objects have disappeared, mm-hmm. and come back a year or so later and turned up in a really you know, completely different place than it was left. Yeah. Um, so do you feel that that was the fairies or um, showing you that they were 
recognizing the respect that you were giving to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And in the mere fact that she saw one, she's like, it, it hit the ceiling. She, and I was like, so what did it look like? Yeah. And she was like, okay, mom, it's, we're not talking about cartoon Tinkerbell or anything. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but she says it definitely, because I was thinking, well, was it a camouflage, a moth or, you know, a bug? Or she was like, no, no, this no. was not. And by the time she even realized what she was watching and what she was seeing, she thought to get her phone and all she could do was just message me. It was nothing else that, you know, you couldn't see anything else. I yeah. think my grandson opened the door and was like, oh, you know. <laughs> um, what did but, it, yeah. What did it look like? Okay. She she really couldn't even describe it uh, to mm. me. I would have to let her describe it. Uh, and yeah. she didn't type it. I think she she sent me a video recording. I mean, a, a voice recording. So uh -huh. I'll I'll have to listen to that again. But um, she would say it definitely wasn't any kind of insect it yeah. was a theory <laughs> wow. like okay wow you know I, I really yeah. just took it as as we were forgiven for that you know mm -hmm. it was ignorance in us uh, you know and to make sure that we just you know express that and let others know that whether you believe in different entities or not just have the respect for even just the story Yes. Just have 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 the decency to be okay with whatever someone is experiencing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and just show just the basics of just respect. And mm -hmm. in doing so, you you show that to yourself and the the energies and the entities that others may be talking about. If you have never experienced them, then you're you are open then from then, that point on, you're opening yourself up yes. to maybe yeah. have encounters. Right. But, Definitely. you know, I just feel that mm. the more times we have conversations like this, the the better. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I definitely want to know how they look. So I'm I'm going to ask her again. This was this was last week when, oh, she, wow. she, had that, yeah, when she had that encounter. Oh, oh that's very, interesting, isn't it? Yeah, because very new. We've we've been talking for a while about doing mm -hmm. this talk. Isn't isn't that interesting that we yeah. managed to get this date in the diary, and then a week before, a few days before, your daughter has that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that it's amazing. it's it's ongoing. It's like evolving. Yeah. <laughs> it's yes. ongoing. Yeah, and other people I've spoken to, that's their experience. It's just something that keeps rolling, and the mm -hmm. more we interact and recognize these beings and respect yeah. them connect with them the more experiences they bring to us right and as, and as we were talking just now a few minutes ago I saw another orb fly over my head that was caught on camera oh my white orb yeah okay so I, I can't see any insects in here there aren't any flies so um yeah. Well, that is so cool. Like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to look in the camera so that when viewers are viewing this, they're not seeing me look down. So I'm missing whatever's yeah, happening with you. I'm, I'm not able to see it until I look, look yeah. at you on the screen. Interesting to look back. <laughs> and you, you're also saying, Ramona, about the, the old pathway. Was that in Mississippi, the old roadway where the soldiers... Um, Oh, the uh, the Nat yeah. There's a parkway, a federal parkway called the Natchez Trace, uh, mm. Natchez Trace Forest Preserve. Mm. I think Natchez Trace Parkway Forest or something like that. Yes, uh, I think I told you about the um, there were Native Americans along that area. It's, mm. They were some of the cities in that area are named after after tribes. So you have Choctaw, the Cherokee. Um, I can't remember one of the others, but I think this was in the Choctaw County. Right. My daughter and I, uh, she had found some research online about the uh, witches dance. I think that was what it was called. And um, it's a location along the Natchez Trace where. Um, 
women or and men, it was a group of people that would dance in honor of the the many deaths that had happened through mm-hmm. the natives at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, so we know a lot about, you know, on, on a probably hopefully on a global scale, how uh, a lot of native people, when others came into the space, yeah. slaughtered them. Mm. It was easier, I guess, to just kill them and mm. then take versus allowing themselves to, you know, understand each other. And, yeah. you know, they realized that the people were very close to nature in the land and they yeah. probably witnessed a lot of mystical things that had happened. Mm. So yeah, out of fear and ignorance on their part, they yeah. would just kill the people and just mm. move right in. Well, yeah. when they move mm-hmm. right in, they're still on sacred ground. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that the energy and the history and the memories that that ha- land holds goes away, right? <laughs> it's still there to this day. Mm-hmm. So along with that, we had decided to, um, we had decided, or actually we were guided to go there and, you know, and contribute to this. The work that we had been doing on at that time was pretty much ancestral. Like it was our first time really deep diving into ancestral knowledge, just tapping into our own and waking waking things up, you know, within mm-hmm. ourselves. So long story short, we go and there's a storm. Oh. When we arrive, the storm breaks. It was as if there was no storm. There was time gaps in between. I think I was explaining to you before. Um, oh no! And what, so, what was happening with the time? Like, 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 like time, like a gap in time, like where, you know, we're learning now how time isn't what we think. Time's yeah. based on yeah. a bunch of memories that are collected mm-hmm. together. So you you can you can remember backwards and you can remember forward, and yeah. everything is happening mm-hmm. simultaneously. And if you're present, you can experience everything, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming that we were very present in in setting the intention and going. So what felt like an hour or what felt like 15 minutes was an hour. Like it didn't take us long to travel there, but it was a distance, but it didn't seem that way. Wow. And in that time frame of, of, of going from, from Amory, Mississippi to, I can't remember the actual location of the other place. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll look it up and give it, give it to you so you yeah, can see, see um, is, is a good distance of driving and in the storm, like mm-hmm. rain, it was heavy mm-hmm. rain. And then all of a sudden there was nothing. And when we get there, we set up candles and things. We were led to a certain area around the trees, black, dark, off the road kind of thing. <laughs> wow. um, mm-hmm. It felt really, really peaceful. Mm. Um, that was one of the very few times at that time that I had been out in nature like that at night and didn't feel like something's watching you. Like, and, and that's just because it's a fear of the darkness. Like after a certain amount of trees, you can't see anything, Mm. but you're hearing all of these sounds. So you're highly stimulated and your mind starts to play a lot of fun games with you yeah, sure. <laughs> where you think you see something, you think you hear something. So all of these things are going on, but yet we're very focused. So we, we lit our candles. Uh, we did a dance. We did some breath work. And mm-hmm. in that we were guided to just say you're free. Mm-hmm. So it was as if the souls were there and they just needed help. Like yeah, the energy sure. was stuck, stagnant energy, and it was stuck, and we helped release that, oh, that energy. Oh, wonderful. So yeah. then on our way back home, uh, when we leave, you know, leave the area, hmm. all of a sudden we're back in that storm again, <laughs> and then it clears up like it never rained at all, or just this, a quick shower. It was as if we went into a space in time, and then we left it, and we were cleansed to go, and we were cleansed when we left. That's how I, I, felt like it it was an experience for us Mm -hmm. and I'm so happy um that we did that and I can't even remember why like when did that even start yeah I I don't remember like what 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 prompted us to even do something like that but that's what she and I she's my oldest daughter and Mm -hmm. I guess it's it's how you can say that's how we roll (laughs) whenever we get together we we have our stuff we're going to have sage we're going to have mm-hmm. candles. 
I'm going to have my singing bubble, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> We have yeah. stuff that we carry around with us and we do work wherever we go. Wow, that's amazing. And yeah, and it's fun. Yeah. We really have fun with it. Yeah, it sounds great, but it should be fun, shouldn't it? It should be mm-hmm. joyful. Um, me, that's what fairies are about. I, I really yeah. believe that I connect with fairies because they're there to bring me joy in yes. my life and to be able to get away from being serious and mm-hmm. see life from this joyful, joyful yes. perspective. And um, what you said about the the time, you know, the change in time, that's very common in what's called over here and maybe other parts of the world, being fairy led, where people go into a space where it's very quiet, even like there's no bird singing or anything. Yes. And they feel like they've gone into a different space and time. And mm-hmm. time, like you say, they might be there for, yeah. So they might think it's only 15 minutes. But then, like you say, an hour might have gone by or two mm-hmm. hours. Or yeah. they, they find themselves in a place that they can't find their way back to again. So it's like they've gone into a different dimension. Yeah. Do you yeah. think that's what was happening? Like you've gone into a different, t- like a different um, time or dimension. I I believe so because yeah. of the way the way it all just unfolded. It's it's as if we had to be cleansed before entering into that space. So we're not taking. And what I mean by cleanse, it's it's a physical, but it was also a mental mm-hmm. cleansing. Yeah. Um, certain thoughts and emotions and feelings you leave those behind now you're in a space Mm -hmm. where you're going to focus on something intentionally and you really need to be focused on it not trying to remember what's for dinner who did what last week remember something in your childhood you're not bringing those things into the space and then when we left that shower that rain was also a cleansing leaving what we did behind and then you go back to your own stuff but just don't interfere with what you're working on Mm -hmm. that's how it was it felt and and that's the 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 thoughts and the feelings that I that I got from that experience. So yeah, I really think that the more we do something like that, you will start to see patterns. So yes. for that it was the rain. Yeah. And sometimes mm-hmm. it could be a high wind, it could be a silence or a shiver, you know, or mm-hmm. something you might feel cool, you may feel warm. Yeah. But for that particular uh, evening, it was it was the rain and rain, you know, is the water that that not only holds memory and knowledge, but it, it controls a lot more than water it controls uh, a lot more than we give it credit for. So, <laughs> well, isn't that strange? Because also one of the cards I pulled before you came on was water, water. Oh, yeah, uh, look at that. And it's all about accepting your emotions, acknowledge your fluidity as a being. You are the hurricane, the iceberg, the lake and the ocean. It's time to choose. If you sink or swim, dive into the depths of your unconscious. Everything is transient. Allow your discomfort to vanish with the tide. I allow my emotions to wash over me like water, cleansing my soul. Isn't that amazing? (laughs) What? Before we started. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's so I love it. I love it when everything's in alignment like this. That's so much validation right there. Mm. Wow. That was that's amazing. Like last night's card was the ancestral card. Uh and I mm. used the cards mm. from I used the cards from the New Orleans, the New Orleans voodoo deck. Oh this was wow. um, <gasps> Oh, it's a beautiful deck Amazing. of cards. And and I was instructed to pull out all of the major cards mm-hmm. because everything that I will be talking about, even during the Lionsgate challenge, is yeah. it's general yet specific at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it's like something that's going to cover a lot, but yeah. only giving you one thing to focus on. And so mm-hmm. when I pulled that card, it was the ancestral card and respect mm-hmm. was was the thing. The, yeah. that that we got from the card the most i love that so water you pulled a water card yeah oh my. 
And it talks about, like for the ancestral card, it talks about the fluid, like with the full moon mm. um, being in Aquarius. Yeah. Flow, yeah. fluid, our fluids. You know, the fluids that are within our bodies are the same fluids that were in our ancestors until we get down to a singularity. <laughs> yeah. So this is so amazing. It is amazing. <sighs> I love it. I love it. Oh, my Yummy. gosh. Um, <laughs> So tell me, I'm really interested in your Egyptian connection and the work that you do with chakras. And I'm really fascinated by Egyptian magic and mysticism. And I'd love to hear about that. Wow, where do Mm. I start? I know, such a big (laughs) area. Why? I don't even know where to start. I I can Mm. start with, even with the card that I pulled last night, yeah because it's an ancestral card um on in on that card it's it talks about um the egyptian deity um horus yeah um mm-hmm. horus is the same uh, energy named heru then there's heru kahuti heru kahuti is another version of heru <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah. Excuse me. So this is in voodoo. This is in uh, in the comedic in the Egyptian Kemetic. teaching. Egyptian. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so what that what it what the card is actually saying is you know there is different versions of ourselves as we live, yeah. and even through our ancestral lineage, there's still different versions, different mm-hmm. dimensional versions as well. Yeah. And with that card, it speaks about the layers. And um, the order in which things flow, you know, like there is a particular order. And in your in that order, as you give respect and homage to uh, and acknowledge your ancestors, you're also doing the same for you. So through Heru and Heru Kahuti and any other versions of Heru or any other versions of any of those other deities, hmm. um, just remember that as you give respect and honor to yourself, you are also giving respect and honors to others. So as I respect myself, I respect you. And as you respect yourself, you respect me. So Mm. I don't have to tell you that I respect you. You will sense it. You will feel it. And there's like a knowing. There's a knowing. So when I do verbally acknowledge you, it's like amplified, you know? (laughs) When When I say Claire is an amazing woman, Okay, now there's amplification in that because any of the other actions that I show should show respect mm. and, and vice mm. versa. So in these cards with the New Orleans deck, it mentions a lot of the uh, ancient Egyptian and the comedic entities and the and their backgrounds. And it also talks about the the same ones in the voodoo pantheon as well. So right. the people that wrote this. The, this book and created this deck blended the two I see. with yeah. the knowledge and understanding that one preceded the other right they, yeah. they work very well together so that's why even with this card I can mention other pantheons uh, from Hindu to uh, the Yoruba teachings I can mm. mention even from Norse teachings I can mention so many Celtic even and bring them all together for people to mm. understand. So it doesn't matter what your beliefs are, what mm. background you come from. There's always a common core. Yeah, so there's sure. respect in all of the pantheons. And if you see the deities and you were to line them up, you can see where they all fit within you. Mm. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I feel like one one deck or not just one deck. This is my deck. I probably won't use it on a day. Mm. <laughs> but one belief system uh, isn't enough. They're yeah. all pieces to a larger puzzle. Yes. As a child, mm-hmm. knowing, like seeing different things from fairies to shadows or whatever, becoming an adult and still holding on to that mm-hmm. has given me the openness and the opportunity to see things a lot differently from the average person. Yes. <laughs> well, can we yeah. go back? Can can we go back and talk a little bit about any of your childhood experiences with any of these beings? 
the the only thing that I can remember is as a child, and I thought it was a reoccurring dream, mm -hmm. but I always used to play with a snake and a rabbit. It was a white oh. rabbit. Uh, I don't remember any stories or books reading about rabbits, mm -hmm. um, maybe the Easter bunny or something, but mm -hmm. really, I didn't really believe in Easter bunny, so it didn't affect me that way. But I thought, like I said, it was a reoccurring dream. Okay. And I would be running around in a in like a shop or something um, mm -hmm. that had uh, sh display cases like a jewelry store. Yeah. And I would be running around and I was playing with my friend, the snake and my friend, the bunny rabbit. <laughs> okay. Um, after that, I, I, I had maybe when I was like seven, seven or so, seven years old, uh, uh, um, these monster like figures appeared and I was afraid. So I was like, mm -hmm. go away. And that was it. Those have been sort of my experiences mm -hmm. in in dream states, yeah. But reoccurring, like they they happen over and over and over again. Yeah, sure. Um, so I I don't know. I haven't talked to anybody about that, and actually mm -hmm. I haven't thought about it too much until we were talking about it before, and I started to remember. I was like, oh yeah, I had my snake and bunny rabbit, you know. Yeah, um, was, um, but well, any kind of physical. Mm -hmm experiences like some people see and they have interactions I don't yeah but there's a sense of knowing uh yes. that happens yeah. um so maybe I don't have to see them or maybe mm -hmm. this lifetime I'm I don't need that because it would be a distraction um mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. I, I noticed that the people who do see a lot they depend on that maybe a little mm -hmm. more so than those who don't I have to depend on other things which is yeah. mainly myself and no outside stimulation last night when I had the, I had my lights set up so that because I was it was dark out so I had my lights set up and all of these little I don't know what they were um I saw them again today I haven't seen them at all since I've been here but they're little things they were flying around <laughs> I didn't really get to see them because I was focused on the meditation yeah I didn't get to really look at them but I saw them flying around um oh. they could have been you know hiding and and mm -hmm. um maybe fairies in disguise or something but they yeah. really came out and I was thankful for them being very supportive mm -hmm. they weren't biting me they were just all over like landing on the lights and coming around and sitting on my arm and on my legs oh. <laughs> It was a good 15 or 20 of them. Any other time, I would have been freaking out because it was too many. Yeah. Sure. Like last night, it was no problem. And this morning, they greeted. It's like they greeted me at the door when I walked out. It was They were flying around. Oh, I okay. wanted to, like, capture one just to see. Yeah. But something said, no, just leave them. Just let them be. Mm -hmm. Let them be whatever your mind and your Imagine that I'm looking forward to setting up again for the Lions Gate if if the weather yes. permits. This time I'll be a little more, a, a lot more aware of what's in the space with me. Note on what I'm seeing. Yeah, in there because I've I've never I thought that they were little bees. Like we used to when I was growing up, and this is when I go visit in Mississippi, uh -huh. they would be hovering around, and they, we called them little sweat bees. I don't know what they. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't think they're bees at all. But I haven't seen any since I was a child. Oh. And to see that many, I think it meant something. Yeah. And I was so focused on, you know, what I was doing that I didn't uh, give them the proper acknowledgement. I did thank them, but I didn't really just, you know, zoom in and see exactly what they were. Yeah. Um, I, but just I, beautiful yeah. little wings. Oh, wow. <laughs> little wings. I saw a couple of legs, you know. I, I just don't, I just didn't, I don't know why I just did not look and be like, what is this, you know, and maybe hold out my hand or something like that. But well, I, I will next time. It's a heart thing, isn't it? I think in, we know in our hearts with these experiences, mm. you've taken your own personal meaning from it. And sometimes yeah. we don't need to scrutinize it, do we? We just, whatever comes to us, to our heart first, then mm -hmm. just to accept that. Um, and it's interesting with the, the white rabbits because that appears quite a lot in um, folklore over here in Celtic oh, folklore. Really? And stories I've read about pixies 
mm-hmm. in this part of the country that I live in, southwest of England, um, white rabbits quite often appear in fairy stories. Okay. Um, I mean, there's the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. Well. Yeah. So yeah. that's taken from folklore. So it's quite um, a potent symbol connected with the fairy realm here. I don't think I had seen Alice in the Alice in in the Wonder. I don't think I had seen that movie at that mm-hmm. age. I had to be around three or four. I don't think I've seen the movie to even have seen the White Rabbit. Yeah, so it's like a mm. something that came to you as a in consciousness mm-hmm. as yeah. a personal symbol for you. Yeah, yeah. and even the snake. Mm. The snake. The snake was a big, you know, I was a small child. And as I was running around, the snake was a pretty good sized snake. Hmm. I, I I haven't figured that one out yet. Maybe now that it's coming up in, you know, in the memory now, uh, you know, I can ask, you know, what was the, what was the snake about? Was that my protection? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, if so, it, it, it explains the Egyptian. It explains the yeah. Egyptian. <laughs> yeah. With the cobra. And the yeah. and then you were com- coming on to speak about the Lions Gate as well. I want to talk about the Lions Gate and what you're going okay. to be doing for that and going forward because you, you were talking about what you're going to be doing for the next few months. Yes, <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> the Lions Gate. Getting back to Egypt. Um, mm. like I said, I, I had come here for my my daughter's wedding. I moved to Egypt last year. Yeah, and um. I thought it was going to be a quick in and out. Like I'd come for the wedding, uh, take care of a little business and head back. But yeah. I've been on a journey oh, <laughs> um, yeah. since I've been here. And I understand why now. Um, I really feel like I was supposed to be doing this Lionsgate challenge here on this land. This is in Southern Illinois. Okay. Um, and it's a lot of local uh, Native American history uh, here. Tragic in mm-hmm. some cases, right? Sorry, could you repeat what it's called? Because you broke up. Shawnee, okay. Shawnee, Shawnee National Forest is Shawnee. where I am. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Shawnee National Forest. And um, the owner of the the campgrounds, her address is actually... Uh, a part of the tale of the, what is that? The trail of tears. Oh, um, that's yeah. something worth researching. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's pretty yeah. interesting history that took place here. Mm-hmm. So doing the lion's gate uh, challenge that I'll be hosting here, uh, it'll be for four days. So by the time this airs, it'll be over and done with, but that challenge will help me introduce um, a program that I want to uh, promote after that, which yeah. is called the um, it's pursue your passion. Ooh. And I take people through steps on figuring out uh, how to do some problem solving for themselves yeah. and, and detach themselves from um, emotions and in, in, in energies that no longer serve them. And in this process, it takes them on that journey and on the transformational side of that, uh, we continue on with um, either the Lionsgate portal um, tour that will be held in Egypt next year. And then also there's a goddess retreat for most women, if we want to, you know, Mm -hmm. just be women, Mm -hmm. um, that happens in October of 2024. Now, that one is another fire energy uh, Mm -hmm. because in ancient times, it was Sekhmet and Basset that they used to host a festival on what we call now Halloween. Mm -hmm. So I think it's more than a coincidence that a fire festival for fire goddesses would be held on October 31st. And here we celebrate that and call it Halloween. And we put on masks Mm -hmm. when they put on masks of the goddesses and paraded around wow. and doing fire dances, you know, so amazing. it's like, come on. Oh, it sounds amazing. Come on. Yeah. Yes. 
So with that one, with that tour, uh, if if I'll have information about both, but for that one, it will have um, on the 31st, dep- and especially depending on the moon cycle at that time, uh, we will have a masquerade party oh, oh. Uh, on on the boat that we will um, we will hold the the events on, mm-hmm. and we will also be able to go to one of the temples called uh, it's Karnak Temple, yeah. where there's a mm-hmm. segment sanctuary there, so we could do a ritual and meditation in that area. And it's about awakening that feminine fire from within Mm. inside and designing your life intentionally to live the way you want to live. And so um, that's basically what that's going to be about. I'm very excited to still write out the the details. I have the itinerary. Uh, I just need Mm. to to make sure all the details are in order and uh, make sure I'm in alignment with uh, with everything so I'm excited about those two things that are coming they up for sound amazing I was getting chills with you uh describing right? that. Oh my yeah. God. I I feel a connection with Sekhmet um I painted her I've drawn her oh my goodness oh wonderful in my work in my fairy work I quite often see like lion imagery in connection okay. with fairies so in in nature, I've seen lions' faces. Um, they quite often come through in connection with fairies because I feel that they represent this guardianship of nature mm-hmm. and this return of the lion as well. Because the lion's quite a powerful symbol that has been repressed. Yes, as well. So. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just saying the other day, I I released a video on my YouTube about a rock formation on Dartmoor that's called, it's called the Lion, and it looks like a sphinx, this rock formation, and it used to be visible for miles around, and now there's Mm -hmm. like um, a forest that's been grown around it, so... Mm. It feels like these, these symbols in the landscape, and are being kind of suppressed in some way, mm-hmm. maybe not intentionally in some ways, but maybe because people don't realise their significance in some cases. But, yeah, so I'm really interested in lions. <laughs> oh, wow. So, well, you know, a, a lot yeah. of everything that we do is is um, is cyclical. And yeah. so mm. with, with that being said, it freaking happens in cycles. So mm-hmm. when that was exposed, there was energy that was helping people with what they needed at that time. Yeah. And then it was shut off and now yeah. it's opening up again. You know, I wanted to be outside, but it's raining. Oh, uh, yeah, it's been raining. That was, yeah. my, that was my plan. I, I had a beautiful spot for us. And I said, well, uh, I guess it wasn't meant to uh, to show that space uh today um the owners mm-hmm. took me she took me to um a place uh down close by the pond mm-hmm. and she said they call it the fairy circle oh, and I was like oh this will be perfect I can set up right here but I, oh. I, I guess it wasn't meant to be yeah so in that circle yeah. it's where it's a pasture where the horses feed and graze right and there's mm-hmm. mushrooms really beautiful like um oh wow mushrooms like little uh they look like little rooftops yeah and they're going to circle and the horses feed around it they don't there's no manure or anything in that area it's like a beautiful circle so they call it the fairy circle she showed it to me two days ago I didn't know about it before so I'll I'll take some photos it looks like yeah so what I saw my this is how my imagination is Mm -hmm when I saw it I was like oh my gosh like it looks like a little village that has overgrown simply because they're somewhere else on vacation Mm -hmm. but when they come back it's going to be cleaned up and and you'll see it'll look like activity and she said how did you know she said sometimes it looks like someone has gone through and cleaned it up but no one has no one touches it I was Uh like that's because they're away right now doing whatever they do whoever they are (laughs) And 
when they return, they're going to come and clean up. So you oh. don't have to bother this. Just don't touch it. And the horses I, don't yeah. touch it. That's amazing. I've Isn't that amazing? Some photos. Yeah, we call them yeah. fairy rings. Yeah, they, no, they call it a fairy yeah. ring. Fairy I, I was rings. like, wow. Have you heard yeah. of that before? Yeah, yeah. They, really? There's lots of folklore about them. When you see a ring of toadstools or mushrooms okay. growing. There, there we go. You, you're supposed to not step in because the fairies mm -hmm. will whisk you away. So the, the center of the ring is sacred to the fairies. Oh my goodness, this is so amazing. Well, I'm gonna go yeah. take photos. Yeah. And I'll send you the oh, I'll send you the photos. But I I had no idea. And they were so excited. I was telling them about the interview and they were like, what? okay, we've got to come see this. And so I was amazing. like, oh my gosh, it's almost like a perfect circle. And you see the mushrooms, they look like little houses. Oh, it's just so amazing. Oh, <laughs> I'd love, because if you send me photos of where you are and of the circle, okay. I can put them up. When I edit this, I can put them up okay. for people to see. So, yeah, that'd be great. It adds, okay, give awesome. Give an idea of where you are. That'd be brilliant. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, that's, I want, I was hoping that would be the background for the interview. <laughs> oh, I don't worry, we can, we can show people through <laughs> the wonders of technology. <laughs> oh, so yeah. is there anything you'd like to share about your chakra work, your um, Kemetic works? I don't know much about Kemetic, ancient Egyptian Kemetic. Um, um well, Egypt. It's 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 something that I'm I'm really just now coming to terms with sharing. It's been such a huge part of my life, but it's yeah. always been about rituals for me. Um, mm. the, the the ancient Kemites and the ancient Egyptians, everything was ceremonial and ritualistic for them, and that's yeah. how they lived their lives. Mm. And <clears throat> it's like I had always been doing this just didn't realize where its origins were coming from until I started doing more of my own origin work yeah and so when we did our blood test uh some years back I think now they sort of manipulate some of the testing to to make sure people are focusing certain areas but when we did our blood testing right. um wow maybe 15 years ago or so mm -hmm. um ours our three major areas were uh, Ethiopia, Northern Sudan, and Southern Southern Egypt, which is in the, oh. in the ancient Nubian area. It's what they and they still call it Nubia today. Yeah. So when I went to Aswan, I'm seeing people that look like me, like literally, yeah. like my family. <laughs> yeah. And and so I'm like, oh my gosh! So these are. Some of even some of the the Sudanese people that I met that are from northern Sudan, yeah. and then some of the people from Ethiopia, mm -hmm. uh, I just was just meeting people all the time, and they'd ask me what part of the country am I from, until mm -hmm. I start to talk. Then they go, "Oh, you're American," or "Where are you from?" You know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the resemblance and. Even mannerisms and behaviors are are definitely there. So it's like I know where, just to have that sense of knowing where you're from, because um, yeah, many of us amazing. don't, um, mm. is is important. So then my daughter, mm. she had the 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 latest test done, and I, so they showed her that um, her. I think the highest, however they number this, however they rate it, mm -hmm. uh, hers was from Cameroon. So I'm like, okay, this makes sense. Now, if I had mm -hmm. heard this years ago, I would have been arguing about it. But because I've done enough study since, you know, between the last 10 years, I know that the people from Cameroon and parts of, of Nigeria originated from East Africa. Um, so okay. it makes sense that yeah. they would go that in that in that direction because it's just a little bit south and then going mm. west and they would end up over there in migration and yeah. trade, you know. So mm. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. Yeah. Christ that it it helped me understand why I'm attracted to certain things, you know, yeah. certain certain mm. parts of history. Um 
it it just helped me make better sense of myself. And yeah, then with sure. that, I was more comfortable with studying, um, studying different cultures. So mm-hmm. although those people went west, they also crossed the waters and went east, mm. <laughs> which landed them in southern in- India, which yeah. makes all the sense in the world that I'd be attracted to Hindu teachings. <laughs> So, oh, gosh, that's amazing. You know, so learning a little bit about our history helped me understand that I'm not weird. I mm-hmm. just have so many different aspects of myself trying to express itself that yeah. now we live in a time where we can do this and not be put in a straitjacket. Yeah, right? yeah, I know. <laughs> so yes, um, and I, you... I, I am. Oh. I'm ready. I'm ready to uh, to share more about my experience. Um, now, not a, I mean, I'm not ashamed. I'm not afraid. <laughs> so, so, when you first went to Egypt, and you were, you know, flying in, you landed in Egypt. Did you feel an instant connection with that oh. place? <laughs> did yeah. I? Oh, it was very emotional. I arrived at maybe mm-hmm. two a.m. in the morning, which a lot of times my uh, flights do arrive. <laughs> yeah, uh, coming especially from Chicago. Um, so I arrived just like 2 a.m. It, my first time there was during Ramadan, which is yeah. the Islamic, uh, it's an Islamic, uh, festival time, uh, yeah. for the, for a month of, mm-hmm. of fasting, reconnecting, um, and, and all that. It's, it's wonderful. Mm. Um, so I arrive and it's like 2.30 in the afternoon. Everybody's up in there. They're all over the place. I'm like, what the heck? And the next morning, everybody's sleeping. So I'm like, (laughs) so I'm trying to figure out what's going on, right? Uh, Long story short, um, it was very emotional, especially when I start, when I got out, like when I walked out the airport, as a matter of fact, flying over to get to the airport, I just felt this emergence of energy. And not only that, it was a full moon. It was a, it was one of the super moons uh, at that time, yeah. and um, w- we had to circle the airport a, a couple of times before we got to clear to land. So I got to see the moon like three times. So the first wow. time when I was like, "Oh my God, it's a full moon!" I didn't check. Mm-hmm. I forgot to check to see what moon cycle we were in. Mm-hmm. And go around, and then we went around the la- the sec- the third time to start to land to descend to land. And it was, it was like, I can close my eyes now. I took like mental snapshots. <laughs> it was so huge. It's like, I had never mm-hmm. seen the moon speak to me the way it did that night. So anyway, we get, I get there, we land, I walk out the airport. It's like, it was like walking into an oven. It was very warm, mm-hmm. but there was still this sense of peace that was there with me. And I didn't mm-hmm. mind that it was hot and sticky. I didn't mind that I had to get my luggage on the bus. <laughs> I didn't mind any of the, the chaos that was going on. It was, it felt like it was just so okay. And then when I went to the pyramids for the first time, mm. oh, it was an uncontrollable weep. <laughs> yeah. Not because yeah. of just mm. the pyramids, but it was, it was because I think at that, that was the moment that I realized I had done something that I don't think anybody in our family had for who knows how long, hundreds of years, <laughs> had tried to do, which was to go back to that space, go back to an area that maybe it's part of your memory and your DNA or something. I, mm, I don't know. But I think so. Whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was mm. very, very emotional. Mm. Uh I, I went live in my in my travel group at the time and I was trying to play it off, but oh my gosh. And when I turned the camera off, I was like like a baby. <laughs> and so when I went the second time it's with my daughter my oldest daughter and uh we went to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and from there we decided hey let's go over to Egypt because it's cheap and we can mm. we can go there for a few days and come back that was the plan but I had an awakening experience there I went outside of our hotel back balcony and all of a sudden everything just faded away and I just saw all of these 
I don't know if they were letters, numbers or whatever. It was like raining down and everything just faded away and it got and the letters and the numbers and things got really bright. And I was just standing there looking at all of this. And then my daughter comes out. She's like, Ma, I thought you were. I said, she's like, what are you doing? She's like, you've been out here for over an hour. I was like, stop playing. I just got out here. I said, did you see all of that stuff? She says, see all of what? Will you come back inside? We got to get ready to go. Hmm. So apparently I had been out there for about an hour <laughs> looking at something that she didn't see. Hmm. And I didn't say anything else to her because I'm like, I'm trying to process what happened. Like, what was that? Um, the next morning it happened again, but for maybe about 30 minutes. But for me, I had literally just walked out and she came right behind me. But she said it was about 30 minutes. So I mentioned it to a woman that I, I met online. We had been corresponding back and forth for years. She lives in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. She does a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, energy work through mainly voodoo is what she does. But yeah. mm -hmm. other things as well. So she she had a little bit of knowledge of the Egyptian history. And she said, you had an awakening, you had a download. So over the next few years, you're going to get instructions that you can't explain. All I'm telling you to do is do it. Whatever comes to you, mm -hmm. if it, even if it doesn't make any sense, just follow suit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, honestly, now that I'm looking back over the few years, that's what I've been doing. It mm -hmm. hasn't been anything out of the ordinary. It's just that I found that every time a bit of information comes to me, it comes to me as instructions, like here's what to do next. Mm -hmm. And then from there, more information will be led, you know, or given to me by someone or something, you know, I'll get it somehow, which leads me into um, what the comedic teachings were about. Uh, when you hear the average person talk about it, they're always talking about funerary stuff, right. like everything yeah. about the afterlife. Mm -hmm. I think that some of that is true, but some of it is misinterpreted simply because the people that are talking about it haven't made the actual connection and it's designed that way. If it's about the afterlife, that means the people didn't descend here. What if it was about descending and then ascending? both mm -hmm. how we became physical from light beings to going back to being light beings right so yes. not all of that is funerary some of those are instructions on how we became and then some of those are instructions on how to live as a human and some mm -hmm. are instructions on how to ascend and go back to source mm -hmm. that's like a complete story right like wouldn't yeah. that make sense yeah. like what there be an ending story about after and there's no before and and present it just makes mm -hmm. no sense to me mm -hmm. even our human behavior and patterns aren't designed that way there's a beginning yeah. there's a birth yeah. right <laughs> we didn't we didn't just come here as grown-ups <laughs> we came here as infants and yeah. we had to grow into adult humans yeah. So stories were given to me with a different set of lenses. And it's like, look mm -hmm. at it from this perspective, experience it before you teach, experience mm -hmm. it before you explain it, you know, experience it before you go and you start talking about it. Yes. So for the past five or six years, I've been experiencing. So it's, I'm not afraid to do those quote unquote deep dark rituals simply mm -hmm. because I understand that it's only tapping into the deeper aspects of myself, and I should not be afraid of me. Yes. Right? Shouldn't be afraid yeah. of me. Uh, mm -hmm. You shouldn't be afraid of you. No. And yeah. so now a lot of that work has been given titles, shadow work, mm -hmm. you know, ancestral work of, and all that. But it's just work deeper. The deeper in you go, of course, the darker it gets because there's no light, literally no light. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's what the comedic teachings are about. Uh, oh, anything okay. before then, which is the Sumerian teachings, yeah. uh, people don't realize that a lot of that was happening simultaneously. Mm. But because by the time the Egyptian story started to get told, you had an era where something had to be introduced to consciousness, mm. and then consciousness was had to be ready to start developing, mm -hmm. and then 
there, there had to be a time of ignorance so that people can relearn. Yeah. Now we're coming out of the time of ignorance where we're, everybody is learning and everybody has okay. access to the same information. That is no coincidence. I think that is divine design. Yeah. And it's, I mean, these times are extraordinary, aren't they? There are so many people waking up. Yeah. Um, And like you're saying, with with your process, with your journey with this, it does take time to embed, doesn't it? And in... I can look back at the things that I've experienced in retrospect over the last few years and think, okay, that's why I learned that then. Yes. And, you know, and then it's about, yes. like you're doing, stepping forward into your power and saying, right, this is who I am. This is what I'm mm-hmm. embodying. You know, I can give this back to mm-hmm. you now. Yeah. Yeah. Because they talked mm. about energies and everything as well. Everything was about energy. Mm. Uh, everything was about what we're learning in epigenetics right now um, Mm -hmm. and how to be whole so how you were whole how you fragmented and how you became whole again that's basically the story (laughs) like Mm -hmm. threefold we learned it in in literature when you're or in creative writing classes in college and whatnot right yeah (laughs) there's a there's a beginning there's a middle and there's an end yeah (laughs) that's basically it the story is so simple that we want to embellish it with everything. So we created all of this other stuff, which is a beautiful thing because when we come back to the singularity of the first thought ever, Mm. (laughs) that first thought wanted to know more. And so here we are. Yeah. We are all of those thoughts combined. And then we'll, we'll eventually end up back into that single thought again, where it Mm. goes, wow, that was great. Like, let's do it again. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's how I look at it. You yeah, know, yeah. and I are, are both women. We're living on different parts of the plane and we look different, yet we yeah. have so much in common. Yeah. And, and honestly, Ramona, I wish, I wish that I could just cross over into your screen now. And yeah, right. <laughs> just hang out with you for a bit. <laughs> I feel I feel like I know you because we, we've spoken a few times, but yeah, yeah, I've got a connection. Yeah, and, that's been uh, amazing. I've got a little story about when I went to Egypt. Um, uh-huh. I've got two sort of Egyptian connected stories. So before my children were born, I've got twins. So okay. They're coming up for seventeen in September. Wow. Um, yeah, I went for a holiday with my then partner, their dad to mm-hmm. Egypt, to, um, oh gosh, I forgot my name, is the resort on the Red Sea, it's a holiday resort on the Red Sea. Um, there's there's a couple of them, one is called Hurghada, and the mm-hmm. other one is Sharm el Sheikh. Sharm el Sheikh. Yes. Sharm, yeah, you probably yes, went there, yeah. We went to Sharm, <laughs> mm-hmm. and we were staying in this hotel, and every day we had this lovely Egyptian guy that would come and tidy our room for us, make the beds. And he'd make these beautiful towel sculptures. Yeah. You know, on the bed. It was just amazing. Yeah. And we came back one day and there was a baby on the bed. He'd made a baby out of towels. Wow. And, yeah. And we saw him. He said, and he said to me, You have a baby? And I said, No, I don't think so. I don't think, you know, I wasn't thinking I was pregnant anyway. We flew home. Within a few weeks, I found out I was pregnant. Oh, my. Yes, yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't even, I was only like a few weeks, probably about a month pregnant. Not even that. Wow. Yeah. And then oh, a few years ago, I went to, this is after that, I went to a, a sound healing workshop mm-hmm. and um, with a wonderful guy called Stuart Pierce who works with the angels and um, it was such a powerful workshop and I came home and that night I was in bed just sort of drifting off 
and I saw this guy, this man stood by my bed, and he was an Egyptian man mm-hmm. dressed in, he had like a white um, garment on, you know, like a long, I forgot what to call them now, like a smock with trousers uh-huh. and um, a white hat. And he was stood there, and I received the name I received was Rohani. Rohani? Rohani, yeah. I looked that up the next day. I Googled it, <laughs> and it means spirit guide. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, was that his name, or is that a name that he. I think that's what he was communicating with me, that he was my spirit guide or a spirit guide of several. And um, he was connected with Aswan yeah. um, and the pyramid builders. So he was connected with the quarries at Aswan. Uh-huh. This yeah, there's, the, yeah. This is the information I received about him. So, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Did you, did you research the name to see what else may may come up with that name um i think it's i'll have to look back i think it's from urdu i think the name's from urdu um and you said it's rohani 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 with the n yeah. so okay. r o h a n n i Oh, two ends? Yeah. And oh, a, oh, wow. Okay. Oh, that's, wow. Mm. I'll look that up. I'll look into it and see. Yeah, really so that, that was a surprise for me because I was like, oh, wow. You know, this wow. connection with wow. Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> well, so that's good that you've been. So, and it's, and it's been uh, almost 20 years. Yeah, that was 2005. So, yeah, about eight, mm-hmm. gosh, Almost. 18 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, so going going there next year. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to. Oh, my gosh. I'd love to. I'd love you'll, see, to you'll see how much it has changed, mm. uh, of course, over the years. You know, everything changes, but it has changed in such a significant way. Mm. You won't recognize it. <laughs> <laughs> Some things you you probably yeah. still won't recognize, but I'm just saying, um, it has really and even energetically, it has changed a lot okay. uh, to the point where I don't think they're able to even control that. They try, but but they're not. Mm. Uh, for example, uh, the pyramids used to have um, a light show every night, right? And it would be held in English, German, I think, and French. And then mm. on another night, it'd be English, Spanish, and 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 I think German. I think they just rotate one of them. Oh, okay. Now, mm. starting a few months ago, they mm. stopped it. It's been contracted out to uh, for another country, another company from another country. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, um, so now the Sound and Light show is on Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays, I think. I might be wrong. Don't quote me on that. Right. But I know I've gone out there a few times and there's no light show. They won't even turn the lights on. Usually they'll just have like the, the white lights on and oh. then they show. They even stop doing that. So it's just dark. But you see movement. So it's like they're doing something. They just don't want people to see. They know that the average people that live in the area aren't going to really pay attention too much of what's going Mm. on there. And then most foreigners don't know where to look. Yeah. (laughs) What do you think about, um, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. What do you think about these stories that I've seen online about there being secret temples underneath the Sphinx and underneath the pyramids do you think there's well in that or you you have to you have to know that there's more there yeah (laughs) i mean like Mm -hmm. you you really you really do most sacred sites around the world go levels down 
Mm-hmm. This one should not be any different. Why would these things be sitting on top of the ground? It makes no sense. No one built that way ever. We don't build that way now. Mm-hmm. When we build large constructions, we go several layers down and we have different basement levels. And then mm-hmm. under that, we may even have something else. So to believe they're sitting above ground, I think it's very naive. Um, and them being older than what you know, most are going to admit to. Now you have Mm -hmm. people saying that they're, you know, more than six, 7,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a gentleman, his name is uh, Larry Hunter, Mm -hmm. and he's done extensive research as far as water. He looks at the water level on a global scale. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when he did, he did this within Google Earth. So in Google Earth, you can, You can do measurements on anything uh, Mm -hmm. on there. What he did was just focus on the water level. So for the whole planet to be consumed with water and for the water to recede, to evaporate Mm -hmm. or whatever it does, um, it's got to go somewhere. So I'm thinking more or less evaporation. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then you still have weather cycles where it adds more water, rainwater. Mm -hmm. So in this evaporation process, it takes millions of years to get from what we see as a water planet to what it is now. I don't think anybody would argue against that because it's something you learn early in school, geometry. I mean, not Mm -hmm. geometry, geography. So, and even in geometry, (laughs) you learn a little bit of something. We just didn't understand how to, how to read this knowledge that way. Mm. Um, but in his findings, he realized that the, there were certain structures that were underwater before yeah. the first full flood, you know, that we oh. we contribute to yeah. the story of Noah. So we we contribute mm-hmm. that to biblical stories. Yeah. But there was an actual time when there was water after there was other activity going on here. So he predates the pyramids further back, like Mm -hmm. millions of years. Mm -hmm. And in his findings is he showed me where as he was taking the images that Google uh, Earth would help him produce, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you look at the actual pyramids themselves, you see the water lines. And he can he said that the reason why that they're not trying to tell you any dates based on 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 the um the way they carbon date stuff is because you can't do that you have yeah. to look at the material they use and then actual mm-hmm. water lines that are on the pyramids what are you going to wait for me and let me know I okay okay thank you so in in a in shortness in a short story when you follow the water lines he's got how long it takes for water to recede based on, I think, every 900 to 1,000 feet. And it was just amazing to, amazing to see all of the work that he had done over the past wait, 30 years of him, you know, working on this before oh. Google Earth was Google Earth. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when he, he's gone to Egypt about 40 times, and every time he's gone, he, you know, he comes back with new information. He's got so much information on on just Egypt and the pyramids themselves, just it's mm. just mind blowing. Uh, I've tried to interview with him and, and yeah. work with him, but a lot of our scheduling, you know, hasn't worked out right. But he was on uh, Gaia TV on on oh, uh, nice. okay. one of the episodes. Just look him up, Larry Hunter, and he yeah, talks about I'm it sorry. because he talks about the whale bones and Fayum, and mm. he he helps you understand the timeline. Once mm. you grasp the concept of the timeline you can let go of all the other stories because then you honestly realize that this struck those structures are like all the other pyramids around Mm -hmm. the world are millions of years old not just Mm -hmm. that one but all of them are and there's a gentleman by the name of uh, michael tellinger yes michael Mm -hmm. tellinger yes Mm -hmm. michael tellinger talks about the energy uh fields that are around in south africa Yes. And yeah. it's like oh, several people, if they would sit their egos on a shelf long enough to come mm-hmm. together and bring okay. their information together, it would make total sense. 
Yeah. The reason that the pyramids that are in Egypt and the pyramids that are in South Africa look so different is because of those energy fields. They mm. have a lot to do with time. If what? an energy field mm. slows, quote unquote, slows down this process of aging yeah. faster or slower than another one does, whatever's in that space is going to be evidence of it. We're going to see it as evidence of the measurement of time or the measurement of how something ages. I won't yeah, say time, sure. but how something ages. Mm -hmm. So Michael Tellinger says that the pyramids in South Africa are, that the pyramids in South Africa predate the ones that are in uh, Cairo or, or in Giza. Wow. And, yeah. But when you look at them, the ones in Giza look older. Well, mm -hmm. the energy field that the ones in South Africa is different. And these have everything to do with our ley lines, our energy centers. The mm -hmm. earth herself has an energy center. So if that is an area where the energy is cyclical or is going in a different cycle or speed or frequency, yeah. then we're going to witness whatever is in that frequency different from any other frequency. Mm -hmm. The pyramids yeah. in Giza are have been dried out. The pyramids that are in South Africa are still part of wetlands. They have trees and vegetation on them. Yeah. So they're oh. in totally different frequencies. Mm. So one is going one that may look that's older can look younger than the ones that appear to be older to us. And without any of this knowledge, you would look at that and just take the first explanation for you know for what it's worth and be okay with it mm -hmm. but when mm -hmm. I started listening to what Michael Tellinger was saying I was like wow this information needs to be applied to all the pyramids around mm -hmm. the globe or around the plane and then people can have a decent conversation right now it's just one-sided people say oh those are whatever however many years old and the sphinx is however many years old mm -hmm. but they're missing valuable information so it's like yeah. with Larry Hunter and Michael Tellinger mm -hmm. and a couple of other people who have great theories. Mm -hmm. If they were to come together and 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 bring all of it together, the sound, mm -hmm. <clears throat> how mm -hmm. the pyramids were built were not by people. Like you cannot at this day and age still believe that, but people do. So I'm like, yeah. okay, that's okay. That's fine. That's as far as they've gotten with mm -hmm. the consciousness of that. But there are some materials. Have you have you become familiar with the um, the raw materials? The book of the book of I've the, heard of the book of raw. Yeah, I yes. indulged in that so, and read it. But, but, yeah. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. I came across this um, early two thousands, maybe. Mm -hmm. Has it been? Yeah, the early two thousand, and yeah. I printed I printed them out. And that took a lot. <laughs> I printed them out. It took a lot of work. And then mm -hmm. I printed uh, some uh, uh, certain sections of them out again, maybe about five mm -hmm. or six years ago. But I've, I've come across this material so long ago and I started, you know, doing even more research and finding out how things are introduced into our consciousness as a collective. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, I, I love talking about this. So I've got way off. Yeah, track. No, I'm loving it. I'm loving but, it. <laughs> How we learn things is information is introduced to us on us on an unconscious level collectively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why you and I are able to talk about fairy so freely is because the idea and concept was introduced to our consciousness on a frequency that we vibrate on when we talk about this. Yeah. When we're not talking about fairies, we're vibrating on other frequencies. We're doing other things. Mm -hmm. But the moment we are talking about fairies, we start to vibrate on that same frequency, which means anybody else that's consciously aware of that will understand it, will find mm -hmm. this information, and will resonate with it. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. all that means. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. we're, we, we have to uh, agree on every single thing after yeah. that. It's mm -hmm. only on the fairies. And whatever else is on that frequency. Hmm. So what, what, what I can see is when we're talking about fairies, and then I'm talking about some of the Egyptian knowledge and some of the other stuff, 
they must be on the same frequency. And I feel that because I feel it in my heart. Yes, like, right? Yeah, you feel yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So if they're on the same frequency and you feel it in your, yeah, you feel it in your heart space, yeah. then there's something about that frequency that's going to hold a lot of information if we just mm -hmm. sit in that frequency long enough with the awareness of and being able to receive what we what we get with open mm -hmm. arms, like just mm -hmm. say, okay, it may not seem okay at first, but I'm open to learn more. Yeah. Or this may seem a little weird, but I'm I'm interested in learning a little more about it. Mm -hmm. Then you can maintain yourself on that frequency to gather up more information. But as long as it's in bits and pieces all over the place and you you really don't sit in that frequency long enough to to mm -hmm. get educated enough, you'll 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 continue on with everybody else's habits of just bits and pieces of stuff yes so after mm -hmm. I realized just that little bit mm -hmm. I started to sit in frequencies long enough to where you can see all of the truths unfold mm -hmm. yes so you have so many brilliant minds that have great information but everybody's trying to be right mm -hmm. and what if they just come together they will get more of the puzzle piece that they're looking for so with Larry mm -hmm. Hunter and and just those two and the gentleman that does the sound stuff he proved he has this thing in florida where he proved that he created this uh environment based yes. on sound yeah the castle yeah the, the ca castle. yes it's a castle something yeah I'm, I'm just gonna, imagine if the yeah. three those three pieces of information were studied together i know it's, can it's you imagine so right yeah so i'm going to start proposing that like in conversation so that what happens is collectively we start to think about those three things together and we start to see the evidence of it because we'll yeah. be on the frequency of it right mm -hmm. and you start to see the evidence of it yeah. now you have people organizations that know this already yes and so a lot of this information is kept in a way where people can research so then when you have um, writers who mm -hmm. go to this certain institute to pull off information to research. They create movies. And what mm -hmm. happens is we watch the movies <laughs> with fragments of the information is introduced yeah. to the unconscious collectively. Yeah. And then we start to experience it as manifestations in our existence. Mm -hmm. That's the false way of introducing something to consciousness yeah but, but i think right now is we're at a by any means necessary <laughs> yeah. to wake up enough people that if you see a movie that resonates with you on a certain frequency the frequency will then introduce the truths behind the yeah. falseness and then you hone in on that and that's when you start to meet others that you can resonate mm -hmm. with on that frequency. And the frequency will straighten itself out. It doesn't need our help. We're in it. It's not mm -hmm. in us. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we go into its space and hold our space, hold our thoughts and our feelings long enough to start having these experiences. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. that's what I was getting from all of the teachings. It's just that one thing, like sit in something long enough. Mm -hmm. And then when you do, you'll start to honor and respect yourself. You'll start to see the results of it. The water will be, all the elements will start to show themselves. The water will be introduced. The fire will be introduced. Like air will introduce itself to you in that frequency. Mm -hmm. Earth herself will introduce your, itself in that frequency. And then we have these amazing experiences. So yeah. mm -hmm. it's like, like, wow, like, can we hurry up and get this going? Cause it's going to be a party. <laughs> I love that. I love that explanation. Um, yeah, for me, like you say, sitting in a frequency of something, mm -hmm. that's what I, you know, I do with my fairy work. I, It's about trusting what you're receiving. It's like what we were saying yes. earlier. It's yes. trusting what you're receiving as your own experience that you are then contributing back to the, mm -hmm. the wider Mm -hmm. experience yeah um so instead of 
like you say, chatting about TV programs or films, and oh my God, you see that film. It's about turning the film off <laughs> and going out and experiencing it for yourself. Mm-hmm. Saying, right, well, I'm interested in connecting with fairies or whatever it is, reading about it, but embodying it yourself, isn't it? And like, yeah. like you're saying, mm-hmm. so that then it's coming from what, what if that was the only way that it could be introduced to you was through a movie or a book or yeah. a TV show? Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't mean that you take that for a truth, but it was a way to be able to introduce something yeah. to your consciousness. And then you on your receiving end saying, hey, there's something about that that I remember. Yeah. It's like, oh, let me find out more about that. <laughs> mm-hmm. And then for those oh, who doesn't, yeah. they'll just go, well, I don't like that. That's stupid. Okay, well, it's not for them. No. no yeah. It's not for them. Yeah. When I think about, like, oh, my gosh, I think about Disney, you know, mm-hmm. the children. As children, we watch all these Disney films. And yes. that kind of way of seeing the world is very much embedded. Mm-hmm. From yeah. Early age, isn't it? Well, yeah, and, and just imagine the writers at that time had their hands on information that was sacred. Mm-hmm. So a lot of these Disney stories are based on sacred texts. Mm-hmm. And those who studied that sacred text in out of the respect of wanting to know and, and embrace the knowledge were used to interpret it. Mm-hmm. And so when people were writing this stuff, like you look at some of the old Disney films, they are so deep. And it's like, why would they be shown to children? Well, the energy itself knew that at at that age, if it's shown to children, 50 years from now, these children will be holding or be able to tap into a frequency that's going to better suit society as a whole. Yeah. The energy itself knew that. We didn't know it. The people who were writing it didn't. They just wanted to make money. But they were used as well. So Mm -hmm. I don't even fault them anymore. Like the the energies in themselves used whatever it had to do (laughs) to Mm -hmm. make its way into our consciousness on a level where it appears for us to be free will. Free will Mm -hmm. still plays a big part in all of this. (laughs) Yeah. So with that being said, you, it's up to everybody to make their own choices and decisions, but it was at least introduced. Mm. Like, it's like, yeah. here's something here and here's something over here. You know, both are coming from the same text. They just look different. Which way, which one do you want? You want the one that looks good, that's that's not good for you, or you want the one that tastes terrible, but is good for you? <laughs> It's like one of those things. Yeah. It's, gosh, that's got me thinking. That's right? got me thinking now. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's how my, this is what's going on up here all the time. <laughs> it's not my mind's going, but what about, oh, my God, what about, like, 500 years ago when there was no <laughs> television and the books and people couldn't read but they were still passing on stories weren't they, they were they're telling passing, stories yes they were telling, they were stories. telling stories mm-hmm. oh yeah. gosh the power of stories the power of the vibration of sound creating yeah. words is what's mm-hmm. creating all of this. The moment we speak something, there's a vibration mm-hmm. that starts to take place and we just don't see it. Like mm-hmm. the, the parrot right now is still dancing. Like, <laughs> and when I was playing the singing bowls, whenever I hit each one, because yeah. each one has a, a different pitch, it, mm-hmm. it would do this. It would shiver or wow. twinge, you know, twinge. But when I played all of them in the order from the root to the crown chakra, it started dancing. He, uh, he was like jamming to the, <laughs> and then when yeah. I would hit one single sound, he would do this again. And so I hit each one of them in the order and then he started dancing again. What's the parrot called again? I just had to tell people that are watching who we're talking about. We're talking uh, about the parrot, parrot. I'll, I'll put a picture in there too. His, his name is Jewel. 
Jewel. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm not a parrot expert, so I don't know what kind of parrot or yeah. parrot or is that what you call it. But he, they call him Jewel because he looks like jewels. <laughs> He's got all the colors of the rainbow spectrum on him. Fabulous. Yeah. Gorgeous. Uh, He's gorgeous. Yeah, we got so a I've picture to, of Jewel. Yeah. Oh, I will. That's I will. I, I'll even send the, the video of, uh, I recorded it for my children to see. So mm -hmm. I'll share that. But I was saying to them what I was just explaining. I hit a note and and he would do this. But when I hit all uh, of them yeah. together in the order from the root to the crown chakra, mm -hmm. he was he was bouncing. He was <laughs> oh, sweet. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, it's amazing to watch so an animal like a, and this is a bird. And you know, parrots do yeah. have vocals. So he says, he says hello, he says goodbye. Uh, he says, help. <laughs> help. Oh, <did> <laughs> um, it, it's a, it's amazing. It's amazing. Wow. Like, <laughs> I couldn't have dreamt of this. I couldn't have made this up. <laughs> so Ramona, it's been amazing talking with you. I can't, there's so much we could talk about. Can you share with everyone how they can find you? And okay. Uh, anything that's going to be coming up? Yes. Um, well, like I said, I do have the Lionsgate um, challenge that's coming up. People can still join that group. The group name is um, um, Wealth and Prosperity Through the Principles of Energy. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll send you the link to that. Yeah, that's please. the group where I will more than likely as the Chakra Alchemists do a lot of activities, not only just the the, the portal challenge, but mm -hmm. I'll have other things that I'll do in there as well. I've done meditations in that group i've done work through the moon cycles explaining the moon cycles uh in there so i'm i'm going to really really focus in on that group and mm -hmm. put together i do have what i'm going to offer is a um a prosperity plan for the rest of 2023 and then for the year of, for the whole year of 2024 mm -hmm. uh it's it's some really good questions that you ask yourself on where you want to be uh, in your income bracket or your income level. And yeah. then I also have uh, with it is a breakdown of the Sri Yantra, which is the major Yantra in Hindu, where it's mm -hmm. levels uh, of it that match the levels of our energy centers. It matches the levels of just about everything in creation. <laughs> and so with each level, you have questions that you uh, ask yourself and answer. Mm -hmm. in depth and then at the end of it you will have a more clear and intentional purpose for working towards your goal mm -hmm. and and okay. most of the time we're, we're working towards something because we need some kind of financial assistance to help us yes. live yeah. but although that will be uh the result mm -hmm. of the work you do the work you do is more important that way you're yeah. not chasing money you're not mm -hmm. chasing goals and trying to figure out everything. You you're gonna we're yeah. gonna flip it around a little bit and have the transformations happen within you, and then the result of it will be whatever your your natural gifts are. Mm -hmm. Really, should be what's bringing you your income so that you can live and enjoy you know your experience as a human here. You're like, <laughs> and I've had to do that, and and so. Um, it's it's something I feel really passionate about. This like if we if we can just get this in our spirits, in our souls, let our souls just rest. Yeah. In if we can get in, get on on track with our spirit, sparking off the right sparks for us, mm -hmm. keeping us in alignment with our higher selves, then our souls will be pleased with the experience that it can take back to source. That's how I can how I envision all of this, mm -hmm. and. Once I started thinking this way, it sort of shifted even how I was feeling. Like I grew up with eczema. Yeah. And so mm. the healing happened because of um. my reorganizing my thinking patterns. <laughs> um, as I was growing up, I had these self images mm. that weren't, I'm um, trying to find the really kind words. Um, 
I guess most of us can relate to it. Like you just beat up on yourself. You compare yourself yeah. to others. You just don't feel like you're worthy enough, yeah. you're good mm-hmm. enough, all of mm-hmm. that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I would look at other little girls and wish I could be like them. Not really understanding at the time that what they were thinking about me was the, quite the opposite. Like, I wish I could be like her. <laughs> um, and so it's it's amazing how you you don't value yourself enough to understand, you know, you are enough. And so yeah. even going through mm-hmm. a process like trying to make money could be affected by that, mm-hmm. those, those thought patterns. So through this process, we, we work through the transformation of that. And on the opposite side of that, you will see a difference in um, a lot of the things that you desire will start to uh, unfold for you. You will be in alignment with attracting the things that you want to experience. And you will be setting intentions that also re- that also are in alignment with Earth herself. Yes, like we have our own personal intentions, but you better believe the universe has intentions as well. Yeah, and because we are a part of the universe, guess whose mm-hmm. intentions are going to supersede yours? If <laughs> yours mm-hmm. isn't in alignment, so it's not to say that it's that parent-child relationship thing. It's just the deeper aspects of you, when it's time for them, that part of you to want to come out and be expressed, yes, it will find a way. Yeah. <laughs> it will I, find a way. So this helps mm-hmm. guide that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's what the group is basically about. And then from there, um, the intention for me personally is to get people to Egypt to have that self-initiation, like that self um that part of you that goes, okay, so we've done this work. Okay, now what? Okay, well, then you go to Egypt and you really experience all the things that you've learned. Yeah. You experience it firsthand. And then when you come back home, there's follow-ups. There's things because you're still active in the group. There's follow-ups. And you may choose another location mm-hmm. to go visit to have another experience. I only focus on Egypt, but maybe over time, someone else will come into the group that focuses on South America or Europe or you know somewhere else. Yeah. Mm. Wow, sounds amazing. Only on Egypt. That's the only um information mm. I've been given to, the only destination yeah. I've been told mm. to focus on. So uh, I'm 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 open and waiting and excited to expand the group more so where people can go to other places yeah. as well. Yeah. Great. So you'll send me the links for that. Yes. And I yes. can share with people. Yes. Yeah. Okay, oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, it's so exciting. It sounds, it, gosh, it just sounds mind blowing what you're doing. And thank you for doing what you're doing and for coming. Thank you. And spending some time to speak with me today. I really appreciate um, this conversation. It's been awesome. We've been talking for nearly two hours. It's just blown by. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know I've I've done a lot of talk. I love <laughs> I love talking, but it's it's so amazing to be comfortable enough in in a space where I feel comfortable to to talk. Like yeah. you know, I, don't, I didn't hold back. <laughs> That's great. Thank you for sharing. My thanks to you for listening to the end of the podcast. And thank you to Ramona Miles for being a great guest. I've driven up to a favourite place on Dartmoor at Trendlebeer Dan, where there's a car park overlooking Lustley Cleave to record the outro for this episode. We covered so much in our chat and part of our discussion that really struck a chord with me was talking about the place between the storms that Ramona encountered at the witch dance, uh, the place on the National Park Trail that she was talking about whilst she was doing her ancestral work. And it seems that when we slow down and connect with our truth, with our true selves, with our roots, Take time to breathe, take time in nature just to unfold. That's when we can experience time and our reality on a 
whole other level. I've heard this before from other guests about um, shifts in time for time as we were talking about in the episode the reality is that time is a human construct or time as we quantify it on earth so it's very much linked in with our consciousness our awareness of time and there have been scientific studies of this mindfulness is a way of slowing down our experience here on earth and taking in more being able to appreciate the world that we're in take stock of our lives and create these gaps these time gaps that Ramona was talking about I think that's part of this experience these experiences that people have of um, time dilation or missing time And I've spoken to other people on my podcast about this, about being somewhere and then realising that there's a shift and perhaps that they've moved into a different time frame. Uh, There's a great researcher, British researcher, called Jenny Randalls, who has a book called Time Storms, which I highly recommend if you can get hold of it. And she goes into this phenomena um, in quite some detail. And she talks about the Oz factor where everything goes quiet, there's no bird song, there's no sounds, and it's like people come into this, literally this time between times. Where where we are at the moment in our human evolution and currently in this present time with what's going on, and we might be feeling a sense of hopelessness, but there is hope, there's always hope. We can turn the idea of um, hopelessness around and to affirm to ourselves that there is always something to be hopeful for. No matter what's going on around us, which I know is very difficult and emotionally and mentally challenging for all of us at the moment, this is the time to really take stock think about our own well-being because without that we can't help others send out our prayers of uh, hope to others and cultivate hope in our own lives but this is the thing that will keep us strong keep us going forward give us resilience for any other challenges that come our way It's been a difficult year for me and I know it has been for lots of people with my own personal challenges that have been going on in my life. And as I look around me today with the rain coming down, I see beside me this beautiful rainbow. I wish you could see this. It's amazing. It's just coming down from the clouds and into the valley that's beside me. And whenever I see rainbows, I connect that with hope as many people do it's they're a symbol of hope that no matter how bad how great storms may be in our life um that there is always the presence of something that will give us hope that will give us some uh, a, a sense that things are going to change because this too shall pass nothing lasts forever especially within our short human lives, um, our relative short human lives that we're here on the planet. There are so many changes that we'll encounter and challenges. The, the, one cert- the only certainty is that we're not going to get out of this alive. <laughs> so we might as well do what we can to make the most of our time here to be kind to others, most of all to be kind to ourselves, look after ourselves and find ways to cultivate that sense of hope in our lives. So I really wish you well and until the next time, remember to keep your heart open and be the change.